Um, without further ado, I want to jump right into uh, what we have for today because I do not want to keep you longer than I'm supposed to. In my church, I usually get about 45 to 50 minutes to deliver a message. You have only left me with about 20 to 25 minutes to deliver <laughs> the message. And so I will try to do so uh, very expeditiously and efficiently, uh, being mindful of time. I want to start off by simply telling you a story about my childhood. Uh, many of you have heard in the bio that I received a full ride track scholarship from Western Michigan University. Well, my track days did not start at Western Michigan University. They started long before that when I was just a teenager running over here in Lansing, Michigan for uh, the Hershey Track and Field. And the Hershey Track and Field always held a state meet in Howell, Michigan. And if you qualified in Howell, Michigan by running fast enough, you would be able to go to the national meet in Hershey, Pennsylvania. I remember one of my first meets up in Howell running the 800 meter dash or 800 meter run. I remember that as I was standing there looking at all the guys around me, I knew that I was going to beat everybody in this race. Why? Because I was the best and the baddest in the race. And while I had not run against any of the other individuals, I just believed that there was something inside of me that was going to make me better than those who I was running against. And so, as the starter began to say, runner set, and then the gun went off, I noticed that I had gone 10 meters and all of a sudden looked down and realized my shoe was back at the starting line. <laughs> so, looking down when only with one shoe on, I began to ask myself, what should I do? But since the race had just started, I figured I could go back and pick up my shoe. Why run two whole laps with no shoes on when my shoe was just 10 meters back at the starting line? So as I made my way back to the starting line, I reached down and picked up my shoe and began to slide it on. I looked up in the stands to try to make eye contact with my mother, and I had a smile across my face. Why? Because I knew I could still win this race. <laughs> Even though the gun had gone off and the other runners had gotten 50, 60, and some 70 meters into the race, I still just believed that I could still win this race. And so as I slid on my shoe, I began to make my way around the track and all I was thinking to myself was this would be a great story to tell my grandchildren. <laughs> I'd like to pause for a moment to pray. Would you please bow your head with me. Father God in heaven we come before you right now thanking you for this opportunity to gather before you. Pray and ask that you will now remove me, hide me behind the cross. Ask that it will not be my words, but your words, not my truth, but your truth. I pray that as a result of the time in which we spend together on this afternoon and this luncheon, all of your people here in this room will be edified. You, our great God in heaven, will be glorified. It's in Christ's name that I pray and ask these things. Amen. In Philippians chapter 3, we find the theme for these lunch and luncheons. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. I want to read them in their entirety first before I spend just a few moments trying to walk you through some of the significant meanings and points of this particular passage. It says here in Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, not that I have already obtained it or have already became, become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead. I press on, verse 14, toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. For a brief moment and a little while, I want to just simply talk to you on the theme of this year's Lenten luncheon, which is the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Here we read in Philippians chapter 3, Paul is really having an argument against the Judaizers, individuals who think that they can obtain perfection by proclaiming, professing, and keeping the law. Paul wants them to understand that your ability to keep the law will never make you as perfect as you ought to be because it is only through faith in Jesus Christ that one can obtain ultimate perfection, which means one cannot obtain it on their own. They must use Jesus or to rely on Jesus to obtain it for them. He begins his argument in chapter 1 talking to these Judaizers as well as those who will listen to him, trying to help them to understand that it is not by their strength nor their might, but it is only by the power of God through Jesus Christ our Lord. In chapter 3, he begins to get to the goal of life. And what is the goal of life? Paul's chief end or chief goal in this life is to pursue 
passionately perfection by knowing Jesus Christ as personally as he possibly can. Let me say that one more time, just a little bit differently. Paul has a personal pursuit of perfection by trying to come in contact with knowing Jesus Christ to the greatest extent that he can. In other words, he wants to know Jesus, the power of his resurrection and his suffering perfectly. And so what we see here is Paul describes in chapter 3, talking about the fact that he gives his resume of God, about how great he is and how much he has done, but yet that is all considered nothing in comparison to knowing Christ. He goes on to talk in the verses preceding verses 12, 13, and 14 about him trying to obtain this perfection of the power of knowing Christ in his resurrection, which means he is hoping to one day become perfect. Now, that all being said, let's get to the text at hand and what you called me here to actually expound upon. Verse 12 says, not that I have already obtained it or have already become perfect, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Paul's personal pursuit of perfection is what we see here in verse 12. Paul's personal pursuit of perfection is outside of his possession. What do I mean by that? That means that in Christ's pursuit, or in Paul's pursuit of perfection, he has realized that at this point he has not yet obtained the perfection in which he is so passionately pursuing to be one with Christ. What Paul is simply saying here is that not that he has already obtained it. In other words, Paul wants to dispel any myths or lies that people may have said about Paul being perfect. Paul realizes that he has not become perfect yet. Why? Because the best is still yet to come, which means simply this. While he's on this journey, this Christian road, trying to pursue passionately perfection, he has not yet gotten there yet, but he is still making his way there. People who see Paul, as spiritual as he is, running around, preaching the gospel, planting churches, would assume this man must be as close to Jesus as possible. In other words, he must be like the Pope, y'all, but guess what? Paul wants to make sure that he dispels the lie. No, I am not the Pope, nor am I in the place of perfection just yet, where I have obtained a perfect personal relationship and oneness with Jesus Christ my Lord, which means simply this, I'm pursuing this perfection, but yet not gotten there just yet. Why is that important? Because so often in our lives, we see different people, preachers, different spiritual leaders, and we think that they are at a point of perfection, but I'm here to tell you that there is not a man this side of heaven yet to reach perfection on the face of this earth. And so Paul wants to make sure that you and I understand that you and I, just like he has not yet gotten to perfection. Second thing that I want you to see here is Paul is not discouraged by this because he says, it goes on to say, but I press on so that I may lay hold of that for which also I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Oh, goodness. This is where it gets good. Yes. I broke my rag. Paul's personal pursuit of perfection has already taken possession of him. Now, I just told you in the first idea that Paul, what, is personally pursuing perfection but has not obtained it yet. Now I'm telling you that the personal perfection or pursuit of perfection that he's actually trying to pursue has already taken possession of him. Let me explain this to you. See, when Paul was on the road to Damascus, he was actually a Pharisee, a very pers or very public Pharisee, looking to persecute the church. But it was on his way to Damascus when he went to persecute Christians for the sake of Jesus Christ that Jesus Christ showed up and spoke to him, knocking him off his horse, helping him to realize that the one he was persecuting was all was truly God. Paul getting up off of his horse, then moves forward in his life as one of those prolific Christians who what? Goes around planting the gospel, preaching to people, telling them the truth of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Why is this significant? Because Paul knows that at the moment of his conversion, perfection obtained him. How did perfection obtain him? Because Jesus Christ is the perfect substitution of sacrifice, atoning, or perfect, perfect substitution of sacrifice and atonement for you and I and our sins. Let me explain that to you. I use a lot of big words there. I'm using my education from Dallas Seminary once in a while. I like to show that thing off because I paid big bucks for that. So, let me help you understand what that means. What it means for Christ to be the perfect substitute, the perfect sacrificial atoning lamb, it simply means this. It means that your sins and my sins have been transferred to him. His righteousness have been transferred to you and I. All we have to do is believe. Now, that's as simple as I can put it, but I see you didn't shop, and that was your shop, so some of you missed it. Let me 
me help you out. Many of you have had parents in the past, maybe even have parents now, or other people who have been gracious enough at times to take on your debt as if it was their own. You see, credit cards do it this way. You can transfer your balance to somebody else's balance, and therefore, they will pay your balance, your balance being zero, but they are still paying the price. Understand something. When I transferred my balances or what I owed to my parents' credit card, they paid the price while I kind of went scot-free. Yes, guess what? I also bought some more stuff so they could transfer that also <laughs> and pay that off later, too. Here's the point behind it. The point behind it is simply this, that someone still paid the price for the purchases and which which I had purchased. Jesus does the same thing for you and I as he takes on our sin and the sins of the world and all those who believe in him. That if we believe in him, then the sins in which we have committed will no longer be personally held against us because they have been charged to Christ's account. Mm. You yeah. still didn't yeah. shout, so let me give you one more. <laughs> I realize I'm at two men in the truck, so let me give you one that may hit more home. I did the due diligence of looking over your website, and I noticed something when I looked at your website. You have several ways of actually moving people, and I'm going to give you the top three. The number three one is the unpack. That's where you show up to the house and you simply unpack their stuff and put it wherever they said they, they wanted. Number two would be, of course, the partial pack. And the partial pack is where you actually pack up one or two rooms or two items and take it wherever they want to go in and drop it off there. Amen, but then you also have... <laughs> But then you also have the full pack, and I'm going to coin this one a different one and call it the perfect pack. What is the perfect pack? The perfect full pack is when you show up at the door, the owner of the house just simply tells you this is what they want to take. You box it all up. Wheel it out of the house, put it on your truck, take it across town, across the city, or across the state, and then you unload everything in the new house, in the new place. Yeah. All the resident has to do is just simply show up, and that's what Jesus did for you and I. He left heaven, came down here to earth, packed yes. up all of our sin, yes. nailed it to the cross, and yes. said, all you've got to do is simply believe. Yes. Do you believe today? Yes. Do you yes. believe you can move from the old place to the new place? Yes. I see somebody now clapping <laughs> Paul is simply making a statement here. That which he hopes to actually gain one day, which is perfection, has already been given possession to him by Christ our Lord. Brother, I do not regard, verse 13, myself as having laid hold of it yet, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead. Here Paul acknowledges the fact that he will reach perfection in the resurrection, and he's aware of that. He knows that when Christ returns, his dead body gets up from the grave, that at that moment, his dead body will not be a live body, reunited with his soul, and it will be a perfect glorified body, just like the Savior Jesus Christ when he left this earth. Paul realizing that one day his future home or future resurrection will be perfection still does not stop pursuing perfection here, this side of earth. Why? Because Paul is still persistently pursuing his present, present perfection because he wants to look like his future resurrection. That's good. That is good. That is good. Let me explain this to you. When I think about Paul pursuing this perfection, even though he knows that he's not going to obtain it this side of heaven, yet he desires to look like his resurrected body while here on earth, and so he puts all of his pursuits, all of his efforts into becoming perfect, because in doing that, he gets closer and closer to Christ. He becomes more and more and more one with the Savior. I like this because it reminds me I love my lovely wife over there to my right, your left. You see, I brought somebody with me just in case you didn't shout, clap a hand. And I had somebody in the corner who would be doing all those things for me. She is my number one fan. She is what I call fit, fine, and firm. She is my wife, my confidant, my best friend. Understand something. When I saw her, I knew I had to have her. And so I began to pray on a daily basis until God brought her to me. How did I get her? Gentlemen, if you are single, let me help you out. If you really want her, just live holy and God will bring her to you. I'm here as a witness to testify that my wife is my best friend. She is my confidant. Her name is Keturah. Not Pastor Boyer's wife. 
Not the pastor's wife. She has her own identity in the fact that her name is Keturah. That's right. Abraham's second wife, Genesis 25 and 1. My first and only wife. You can check that when you get home, Genesis 25 and 1. Let me get back to what I'm saying because I see I have a few extra minutes now. I've gotten a little bit further through this quicker than I thought I would. So let me help you out here with my illustration of my wife. You see, my wife, when we first got married, she asked me a very important question. I think a question that many wives want to ask their husbands but sometimes don't. She said, baby, do you love me enough not to cheat on me? I put my head down, and I thought, and how many of y'all know I was messed up right there? At that point, I didn't respond right away. I knew I had dug myself into a hole that I needed to somehow get myself out of. And so as I thought for a moment, do I love my wife? Do I love her enough not to actually cheat or to be faithful to her? I had to look up and say, no, baby, I don't love you enough. She said, excuse me? <laughs> Plenty of husbands love their wives. They find themselves in the bed with another woman. So love is not what's going to keep me faithful to you. I said, I tell you what, there will be times in our marriage where you will do things, say things, make me unhappy, upset, or frustrated. And it will not be the fact that I love you or I won't feel like I love you at that moment. And so that's not going to keep me. But I guarantee you this. I tell you what, it won't be my love for you that will keep me faithful to you, but it will be my love for Jesus that will yeah. keep me faithful to you. Yeah. Why? Because Jesus has never failed me, nor forsaken me, nor left me. I can always trust and count on him, and as bad as I want to always trust and count on you, the one thing that I know is a sure bet is Jesus Christ right. himself. And so, yeah. you don't have to worry about my faithfulness unless, my, unless I become unfaithful to him, but as long as I'm faithful to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, yeah. you can sleep in peace knowing that you're the only person that I'm sleeping with. Yeah. Well, yeah. over time, we've been married almost 13 years, and it's funny, over the last 13 years, if you've ever seen a couple married 30, 40, 50 years, there's something unique, special about their love, their commitment, their affection. It's something almost hilariously funny about it, but at the same time, attractive. Yeah. After 13 years of marriage, I looked at my wife a couple months ago and said, you know, baby, there was a time where I was faithful to you because of my faithfulness to Christ. But I'm here to tell you that today, I'm just faithful to you because I just want to be faithful to you. Why? Because I never want you to have to worry about me with somebody else. I never want to cause you that type of pain, that frustration, that anger. Now I realize I may be speaking to somebody today, but let me help you out with something. Many of us dated to get married instead of marrying so we could date. Yeah. See, you yeah. dated to get to know the woman, and then when you got the woman, you decided you didn't need her. She wasn't as important no more, but when you actually marry somebody to date them, then you spend the rest of your life really getting to know them. What am I trying to tell you? I'm trying to simply tell you this, that there is something in the pursuit of a woman that keeps a man on his toes, keeps him energized, keeps him longing to want to be in her presence, to kiss her on her lips, to simply hold her in his arms. The reason why many men don't continue to have that same feeling for their wives is because you stop pursuing her once you've married her. But when you understand that the real joy is in the pursuit, although I would never fully know her like I would like to know her, there is a sense of joy and excitement in trying to get to know her. Why? Because she is bad banging. She is slamming. She is my queen. She is my woman. And I want to do all that I can to let her know that when I said I do, I said that I do to pursuing you all the days of your life, my life, for eternity together forever. Why? Because the actual joy is in the pursuit. Amen. Paul knows that the heart and heart he pursues after Christ, even though he will never obtain perfection this side of heaven, there's still a great joy in pursuing something that's going to bring you great hope, great blessing, and great opportunity. There is something great about pursuing God, even when you know you will not pursue him perfectly. Mm. Let me do another one. That one was too deep. <laughs> My wife liked it. <laughs> Paul's persistent pursuit of perfection means a couple of things. Number one, he says in verse 13, one thing that I do in order to lay hold of this is forgetting what lies behind mm. and reaching forward to what lies ahead. A couple of things Paul must do in order to obtain his goal of perfection or continue to strive for his goal of perfection. Number one, he must leave the past in the past. Mm -hmm. He must leave the past in the past. Too many of us 
get caught up staring out the rearview mirror instead of actually looking out the windshield. Why? Because we're looking at where we've been instead of where we are going. Mm -hmm. And any good driver's ed teacher will tell you that if you look too much in the rearview mirror behind you and where you came from, you sure gonna wind up on the side of the road or in an accident because you're not looking where you are going. How does that fit two men in the truck? Well, many of you know that Randy is taking over or helping out with being the president now, and so you have read that novel of a book that he calls a vision. That's not a vision, y'all. That is a novel. And I took the time to actually go through and read it line by line, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph. I even highlighted some of the information. And if you've read it like I have read it, then you know it does not take too long before you realize what in the world is he talking about? 2017, 2018? This must be a typo. In fact, I started to think that y'all had some bad editors with all the money you had here in the truck. How in the world did somebody let this get by them? But as I continue to read, I begin to realize that he wasn't writing a vision based upon where you were at. He was writing a vision based upon where he wanted to take you. Why is that important? Because if you really want to go somewhere, you got to forget about where you've been and continue to press on to where you're trying to go. Yes. The past at times will hold you back. It will keep you from moving forward. And so if you can actually look to see where you're going, I guarantee you would get there a whole lot quicker. Why? Because you are looking to move into the future, no longer stuck in yes. the past. Yes. Paul is simply saying here that what I do is I lay aside my past shortcomings, my past failures, even my past successes. Because what happened yesterday has nothing on what's going to happen tomorrow. Why? Because the best is still yet yes. to come. Yes. Yes. 7 verse 14, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. We have this image here of the athlete who is straining forward, trying to finish the race in which one has started or been pursuing. And so, sure, we think about those athletes in the heat of the battle who are running a track race or a marathon, those who may be in a boxing match, those who may even be in a basketball or football game. Something inside of them causing them to press on toward the goal of winning the actual prize. Paul wants to press on towards his prize. Now, for many athletes, the prize is a gold medal or a Super Bowl ring or an NBA championship, but for Paul, the prize is getting close to perfection as possible this side of heaven, looking forward to the perfection he's going to experience in the resurrection. We can pursue a lot of things in this life. In fact, most of us spend most of our nights and days, some of our best years, pursuing things that you can't take with you when you live this life. The greatest pursuit, the greatest passion, while you're pursuing a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord and trying to become as perfect as possible here, this side of heaven. Amen. As I prepare to close, I know some of you are sitting there wondering what in the world happened at that Hershey track and field. <laughs> I started off a story and I just left you hanging. And you've been wondering this whole time. In fact, you didn't want nothing I had to say, but you sat here patiently waiting for the end of the story. Well, you know I got a full ride to Western Michigan, and so you know it must have turned out well for me. You know I wouldn't tell you a story that didn't make me look good, so you already have an idea of what took place. But for those of y'all who still somewhat knows me and want to know all the details of exactly what happened, let me explain it to you just like this and tell you what happened. As I begin to run around that track the first lap, I noticed that I just focused on the man in front of me, and as one person, and one by one, I begin to pass each individual. I was making my way to the front, and all I could think to myself was, this is going to be a great story to tell my grandkids. As I began to run the second lap of the 800, which was the final lap, I began to run and kept thinking to myself, I can still win this race. With about 150 meters left, I began to realize all of a sudden that I was not going to win this race. Well, I had made up a lot of ground and caught a lot of people, the reality of it is, is I was too far 
far behind from the beginning to actually win the race. And so as I came around that last 150 meters, a piece of me just wanted to quit and give up. But instead of focusing on winning the race because that was now out, instead of focusing on this great story I could tell my grandkids, I just began to focus on the finish and keep that in mind. And so I did not slow down, but I ran harder and faster and stronger. Why? Because now it was all of simply about finishing my race. And I remember as I was running down, coming the home stretch the last 100 meters, all of a sudden the announcer on the loudspeaker said, ladies and gentlemen, please stand to your feet because the young man who lost his shoe is coming around in sixth or seventh place. Please stand to your feet and give him a standing ovation. Did you just not hear what I said? I didn't win the race, but I'm here to tell you that because I continued to pursue finishing the race, when I got to the finish line or close to the finish line, all of a sudden, I got the accolades and the awards that the person who finished the race should have got. Why? Because people were actually moved by the fact that this young man who had lost his shoe would still run with such passion, such pursuit of perfection, trying to be number one. But even in realizing that I could not win the race, it would not stop me from running and finishing yes. my race. Yes. And at the end of the day, the crowd stands up and gives me a standing ovation. So guess what? I didn't win the race, but I did win my race. Yes. Why? Because my race was just to simply finish this race. Yes. What am I saying to you? I'm saying to you, here at Two Minute Truck, in your life, in your personal endeavors, you make sure that you passionately pursue Jesus Christ yeah. more than you pursue anything else. See, I was pursuing a first place medal, but that's not what I got. I got a standing ovation instead. Some of you are pursuing a prosperous portfolio. You want to make sure that your goods are gorgeous, but I'm here to tell you yeah. that you ought to pursue perfection with Christ in the same way in which you pursue that perfect portfolio, that perfect package that perfect position. Yeah. Why? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters. And I'm here to tell you that yes. even though you may be pursuing some things in this life, you still may not ever be the richest person in the world or have the biggest company or the best position. But if you continue to run your race, yes. pursuing Christ the way you're supposed to pursue Christ, then I guarantee you, just like they did for me on that faithful day when you stand before God, yes. a voice will come yes. over the loudspeaker and say, Ladies and gentlemen, angels and saints of God, please stand to your yeah. feet and give my son or daughter a standing ovation because they ran this race. And although they could not do it perfectly, they still pursued perfection yeah. with me because they understood that while earthly pursuits brought something, it was only the heavenly godly pursuits that would bring them eternal life. Yeah. What am I yeah. saying? Yeah. I'm simply saying make sure you pursue Jesus with the same passion, yeah. conviction that you yeah. pursued everything else. Because when it's all said and done with, all that's really going to matter is your relationship yes. with Jesus. Yes. Yes. I need to pray for you. Mm. I hope that in the midst of the fast talking preacher, that you do not miss the message. Mm -hmm. It is not about me. It's not about track. It's not even about business. The amount of money or success that you will make in this life. But it's about whether or not you and I will pursue Christ passionately. As we look to be perfect. Even though we know we will not obtain it this side of heaven, we do all we can to get as close to it. Waiting for the ultimate perfection and the resurrection. Father God in heaven, we come before you this yes. afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity to gather together. Thank you for your word and your truth. Pray and ask that you will continue to work in the midst and the hearts and the minds of your people and draw them closer and closer to you, our great God in heaven. Thank you for the fact that you are God, you are good, you are lovely. We also thank you for the fact that you sent your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and down on the cross for our sins. For it is truly by his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection, and our faith in those things. It would be made right with you, our great God in heaven. Father, I pray, in spite of the illustrations, in spite of the good time, that what people really walk out of here with is a reminder that their greatest pursuit, greatest pursuit, must be a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus Christ our Lord, to knowing Him as intimately, as passionately, as graciously as you desire for us to know Him. 
help us to live our lives in pursuit of perfection, realizing that while we may not obtain it this side of heaven, it is still a worthy pursuit. Because when it's all said and done with, that is the only pursuit worth anything. That we ought to be brought into the kingdom with understanding that we pursue you just as you have already pursued and possessed us. Thank you again for your grace, your mercy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who leads and guides. I ask that you will continue to use today's words to be a blessing to your people, encourage them to strengthen them, but to also challenge all of us to pursue you faithfully, pursue you first and foremost, pursue you continually, looking forward to the day when we will actually stand in perfection because you made us perfect. Thank you again for all your wonderful blessings. Thank you for this time to gather together. It's in Christ's name that we pray and ask these things. Amen. Amen.